I was wondering to myself, how many of you try to relive or almost experience what has happened over this weekend? Now, I know, again, if you want to become technical, it didn't happen exactly, you know, on the days that we have, but let's for a moment imagine that it was Thursday, and Christ is in the garden. It's Thursday night. He's concerned. Very worried. His disciples have never seen him like this. They see a person who is challenged, not sure if he will be able to endure what lies ahead of him. He looks for support from his close followers, asks them to pray for him. They are eager to do it. He disappears, falls down on his face, pleading, wrestling with God, Father, if it's possible, can you remove this cup from me? But yet not by will, but by will. He stands up, walks back, finds these, his close-knit friends fast asleep. He wakes them up. Don't you realize how urgent this moment is? Don't you see what's going on? Please pray with me. They may be attempt to stay awake for a while. He returns back to the place he was in the beginning, falls down on his face, starts to plead with God again, Father, if it's possible, please remove this cup from me. But the Father is silent. There is no answer. But in the silence, Christ recognizes that the Father has consented what is happening. It is part of the agreement. It is part of what was established eons before. And the reality is it's happening now. And when I look, and I want you to go with me because this is my custom to take you through scripture, I want you to go back with me to Mark chapter 8. Now the reason why I've chosen to speak out of Mark is that Mark uses certain key words that you don't find in the other Gospels. One of the words that he uses so frequently is the word immediately. It's almost as if he's in a rush. It's almost like he, you know, all of this stuff that's taking place is taking up time. We, we need to get to the end. We need to get to what it's all about. And we see that this word is frequently used over and over regarding Christ regarding the way that he goes about his things. In actual fact, the interesting thing about Mark, there's no talk about his early childhood, there's no talk about his baptism, there's no talk about any of that stuff which some of the other Gospels took time to explain. He jumps right into God actually already being involved in doing something. And what is it that he recognizes that is of so great importance? He recognizes, as you look at the book of Mark, that there are two endings. Now, it's so interesting that those of you who perhaps know a little bit about the book of Mark, keep your finger there in Mark chapter 8 and just jump to the last chapter. And I want you to notice that in Mark chapter 16, few chapters, if you have up to verse 8, as the ending verse, in some of the language or some of the uh, original transcripts, that is where Mark chapter 16 ended. And I want you to notice where it ended. Verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the woman went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now imagine if that was just the ending. But since then they found two transcripts that were actual original documents that actually gives a little bit more. And we have actually verse 9 right up to the end, uh, verse, of, you know, verse 20. That was not in the original um, 
Uh, or in the original setting up of Mark, it was introduced later on when they came across the two ancient manuscripts that included it. Now there's this talk. Why do we have two endings? Why is it that we have this one ending and then all of a sudden why do we have this additional ending added to it? Now somehow I grab onto it. Mark introduces two endings. No other gospel does that. And what are the two endings? What is it that we are seeing? What is taking place? What is it that consumes Mark's mind as he attempts to bring out? He's rushing towards the end. He wants to get to the end. What is the end? All along, right throughout the book of Mark, two endings are introduced, two endings constantly given. The one we read in Mark chapter 8, so I'm back there again, back in Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Mark chapter 8, we're reading the first one, verse 31. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And after three days rise. What's the first in ending that we were introduced to? We are introduced to the end of the Son of Man. We are introduced to what he clearly understood was about to take place. He knew his ending. He knew that he had to suffer and die. But I want you to notice something here. Right in his in, in this introduction to this fact that he says, I must be taken and I must be killed. He then says it, but I will rise after three days. Two endings seem to be very predominant there. The one is death, but the other one is a, right, a resurrection. But I also want you to understand something else in this. That Christ was the one speaking. He was the one that was telling them what is going to happen. It's, he knew what his destiny was. He knew why he came to planet Earth. And he came to planet Earth to get to an end that was predicted years ago. That the, the anointed one will be killed, but not for himself. He knew that. And there we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane. We see him falling down in the presence of his father, knowing that this was his last experience, knowing that everything that had been spoken about in the Old Testament pointed to this ending where the Son of Man would have to lay down his life. And he falls down in God's presence. And the interesting thing about the book of Mark is that he, he reveals the humanity of Christ. He reveals that as man he was looking at everything. His, his role on planet Earth, he had placed himself where he had to do what you can do. He had no advantage over you. He was entirely man in that moment. Having to trust implicitly on the words of God. And I mean it's so easy to take God's word and to quote the promises. But when you find yourself in trouble, do you remember those promises? Do you remember what they mean? What they say? And here Christ falls down in the presence of his Father, pleading with God, Father, if it's possible, please remove this cup from me. But there is silence. Why is there silence? Because that is why Christ came to He didn't come to live a comfortable life. He didn't come to be um, 
you know, end up being the, the king of the Israelites again. He came for one purpose, and that was to save mankind. So I want you to recognize something here. That Mark clearly helps us to see that in Christ's mind there are two endings. His ending and his ending is going to play an incredible role on your end. Did you hear it? His ending, the way that he dealt with his ending, was going to have an impact on your end. So in some way, your ending, your destiny, was in the heart of his hand, right there in the garden of Gethsemane. And he could have easily turned away from that and not been willing to go through his ending. But if he had turned away from going through his ending, then your ending would not have been what it is now. So somehow, what kept him going was recognizing, as Paul says, he suffered what he went through because he was looking forward, looking ahead at what his ending was going to achieve for man who was lost. I want you to understand right here in the garden. There is not a we thing. There's nothing about us standing by his side. In actual fact, the closest ones in, to him are sleeping. Later on, they even run away. Some of them even start denying him. There was no support. And I want you to understand something different. When I look at this, what I see is a total revelation of self-denial. A total revelation that others were more important than himself. What I see here in God's word in this experience was that phrase that says, no greater love is revealed than that when a man lays down his life. He did not see any things beyond that. And I want you to notice, he links the fact that he's going to be killed to the fact that he will rise again. Now, I'm intrigued by this. Somehow, he does something. Christ doesn't just stick with this concept of death. He links to this tragedy. He links to it hope. But it was not a, a, a hope that wasn't grounded. He recognized that through the story of Jonah, that as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, three days and three nights, so did the Son of Man be. He knew that there was evidence that although he was going to die, just as real as what his death was, he looked ahead at his resurrection. But I want you to understand that this is almost brought in as a kind of motivation, a personal motivation, because nobody else was giving it to him. Do you remember the story of Peter? Peter says, I will never deny you. Christ turns around to him and says to him, I want you to understand something. The devil wants to sift you like wheat. But I'm going to be praying for you. And I want you to understand, when was Jesus praying for Peter? While he was experiencing his ending, he was actually praying for Peter's ending. Did you hear me? While he was being beaten, while he was there in the courtyard of the high priest and that, while he was there and Peter was busy denying him, exactly as Christ predicted. 
Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Christ said to him, while you're busy denying me, Peter, I, I want you to remember I will be praying for you. What was he concerned about? What was happening to him? I mean, they had just beaten him. They had just spat on his face. They had just pulled out his beard. They, he, if there was anybody that should be focusing on his own experience, he should have been. But it's through all of his own experience, what did he have in mind? He had Peter in mind. And the most amazing thing God's Word teaches me that when the rooster crows, Christ looked up and their eyes met. Peter's eyes met with Christ. And in that moment, it was almost like Christ was saying to him, I want you to remember, Peter, that in your crisis I will be praying for you that your faith will prevail. Here it is in his ending. There is no evidence that what he's doing is going to be rewarded. Nothing. But somehow, as we are to do, he claims the promise that I will rise again. So to this tragedy and difference, I want you to understand, there's a reason why I'm doing this. We are living in a world where there's tragedy. But we must not keep our eyes focused on tragedy because there is a glorious ending. So somehow I'm learning something from Christ that in his ending he was actually allowing us to have hope for our ending. That we could have and choose our ending. Although the word says, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. We have the power now to choose life, even though death has been sentenced on us. We can, because of Christ's ending, choose our ending. And I want you to notice something else, though. He's still in the garden of Gethsemane. The Father is silent. There's this internal struggle going on. Have I done what the Father's request? Have I done what is right? Because I, the full stop is about to be put down. Beyond this full stop, I can do no more. Beyond this full stop, it has moved from Christ's responsibility to the Father's. His ending, although we killed him, was in the end. His ending was still to be determined by the Father. And dear friends, I want you to listen to me. I praise God that our ending is not dependent on mankind's words. Because by now we'll be thrown stones and killed. But our ending is still, like Christ's ending, in the Father's hands. Now, what comfort do you gain from that? Have you lived the, the life of Christ? Have you endured the challenges and been victorious? Or how should your ending and if we have to be measured by the way the Father was measuring His Son, how many of us will have a good ending? So what I'm trying to help you to realize is that we need to recognize that what happened Today, in this time period, what we're thinking was so relevant to your ending. And Christ knew that. I want you to understand something. After being beaten, after seeing the fulfillment of his own words, where it says that he will be rejected by the elders. 
He saw that. He would be rejected by the chief priests. He saw that. And the teachers of the law. He saw that. He sees beyond that. He sees how that his own, he came to his own, and his own did not receive. When asked, what must I do with your king? They cried out, we have no king but Caesar. When they said, okay, but what must I do? Who do you want? Barabbas or Jesus? What did we cry out for? We cried out for Barabbas. The, the sad part is little did we recognize that we were choosing a destiny that is going to end in destruction. But Christ never lost focus of why his ending had to be so clear and accepted. Because when the Father accepted his sacrifice, he made it possible for you to be accepted. Do you understand this? His success was going to be your success. His failure and he didn't approach it with anything more than what you and I have available to us and that is the word of God and I want you to notice in the discussion with Peter he says to Peter I'm going to be praying for when the devil wants to sift you like we do, I'm going to be praying for you. And I want you to understand here, friends, that's exactly what Christ is doing for you at this moment. He's praying for you. Now I want you to notice something. Is he praying for you before his crucifixion, or is he praying for you after his crucifixion? Now I'm talking to you. Is he praying for you before his crucifixion, or is he praying for you after his crucifixion? I want you to listen to me carefully. Is he praying for you before the crucifixion or is he praying for you after the crucifixion? Dear friends, it's after. We not before his crucifixion. Are, are, are any of you still? Where's Christ? Is he going to get one across the way out there? Are we in Jerusalem somewhere? No, he wasn't praying for you then. Do you know that in John chapter 17 he prays for two groups of people? He prays for those that were in his presence right in that moment. But then he's also praying for those of us who are in the future. So I want you to understand that Christ, as he turned to Peter and said to Peter, I'm going to be praying for you when the devil wants to sift you like weed. I want you to understand the devil wants to sift you like weed. But I want you to also recognize that Christ is praying for you. But do you know what? There's something that you've got to do that he can't do for you. He can pray for you. But you've got to do something that he's made possible for you to do. But you've still got to do it. And like Peter, you've got to do it. You've got to, when you have been tested, come back to Christ. And strengthen your brethren. So the, the answer is, Christ's prayer for Peter was not without effect. When Peter left that courtyard, he ran to the, the God of Gethsemane. Most likely fell down there when Christ had been weeping, blood. Most likely fell down there and recognizing that what Christ had just endured was to make it possible that although he had failed, that he could still make the choice because of Christ's success. And I want to tell you, dear friends, I praise God for Christ's success because His success helps me to choose a different ending. Did you hear me? In the beginning, Adam and Eve chose an ending. The ending they chose was death. But we have the privilege of choosing a different destiny. Not the destiny of death, which we find ourselves in, but we can choose life because of Christ's success. So it's not because of your success. So let me explain this to you. If, if you go, so let's do this. I want you to go with me to John, the epistles. And in 
John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. I want you to understand why it was so important that the Father was satisfied. Okay. 1 John chapter 5. We have to come to this. It's a section of scripture we know really so well. But I want you to recognize something. Christ was successful in what he came to do. He came to die for man, he came to be man's substitute, and he was victorious. When he said on the cross, it is finished, into thy hands, I want you to notice this, he says to his father, the destiny of what is going to happen to me is now in your hands. I've done what I'm going to do. I want you to listen because you're going to be doing the same thing just now. Christ, after successfully doing, carrying out the Father's plan, cries out as he's hanging on the cross of Calvary, Father, into your hands I now leave the destiny of not only mankind but myself in your hands. And then the word says he breathed out his breath and died. And what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? What should the disciples have been waiting for? They should have been waiting for the resurrection. Because you see, the resurrection was the proof that the Father had accepted what Christ had done for us. If the Father did not raise Christ from the dead, it would have been an acknowledgement that he had failed in doing it. And the interesting thing is Christ had laid down his life. And he says, the reason why my Father loves me is because I love you. Now he could have taken it up again. He could have risen any time he wanted to. But he lies there in the grave. And what is he waiting for? What is he waiting for? He's waiting for that voice that says, Son of God. He's waiting for the audience with his father. Um, now, in order to understand the audience with his father, keep your hand in 1 John chapter 5. We're going to come back. I want you to go with me to Matthew 20, uh, sorry, to Psalm 24. And I want you just for a moment to imagine. We've seen the cross of Calvary. We've seen that he's died. We've seen that there's a resurrection. But dear friends, there's something that takes place after the resurrection that is crucial and important so that you will have a happy ending. Matthew 24. Oh, yeah. Sorry, <laughs> Psalm 24. Thank you. And I want you to notice, I'm not going to read the first part. I want you to come down to verse 7. To verse 7. Maybe I should read the first part. The earth is the Lord's, verse 1, and everything in it. The earth is the Lord, and everything in it belongs to him. The world and all the living it. For he founded it upon the seas and he established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his in his holy place. And then the answer is given. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, that person and only that person can stand in the presence of God. Dear friends, any of you? Verse 5, if you do have clean hands and you do have a pure heart, he will receive blessings from who? 
the Lord. And vindication from who? From God his Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek you, who seek your face of God of Jacob. I want you to understand something. There is a reward that has to be handed out by the Father. Christ himself says in, in Revelation chapter 22, Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to give to each man according to what he has done. I want you to recognize that Christ has just died. He's waiting to receive his reward. He goes, and I want you to listen to this. Verse 7 says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be lifted up you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. I want you to listen to this. This is as Christ is approaching heaven again after the resurrection. And as he approaches, the angels cry out to the, to the gates of heaven. Open up the gates of heaven and let the King of Glory come in. They ask, who is this King of Glory? The answer comes back. The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. I want you to listen, dear friends. Christ fought a battle. It was a mighty battle. A victorious battle. For you. Again, as they approach the gates, the cry goes out, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, He is the King of glory. And I want you to imagine, as He does this, so jumping from there, I want you to jump into Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Remember, you still got to go to keep your finger in one jar. Revelation chapter 5. Let me link it also to Revelation chapter 4. I want you to look at something with really. me. In Revelation chapter 4, we are introduced from verse. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. Is that correct, verse 8? Even under his wings, day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to Him who sits on the throne and who, lie, who lives forever and ever, notice He's talking to one who's sitting on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before Him who sits on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. And then they lay their crowns before the throne and say, Listen to what they say. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. We're not talking about Christ here, dear friends. We're not talking about Christ here. We're talking about the role the Father plays. It's the Father's role to determine who is worthy. To stand in His presence, and according to what we've heard in, in Matthew, uh, sorry, in Psalm 24, it's only those who have clean hands and a pure heart. The question is, does Christ have clean hands and a pure heart? That is still to be determined. As Christ comes into the presence of the Father, as He stands in Revelation chapter 25, chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And I want you to notice it says in verse 6 Then I saw a lamb. What kind of lamb? You know that the Jewish have a festival of this time. 
It's called the Feast of Passover. What is it all about? It's about a lamb. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Here we see a lamb. And it says there, a lamb looking as if it had been what? Slain. So he said, Before the cross or after the cross? After the cross. It's slain. He stands in the presence of God. You're going to see that. Now. The one who's sitting on the throne, he's sitting on the throne. That's the Father. The Son stands in his presence. What do we need to hear now? What does the Father have to declare? That the Son is accepted. The question is asked who is worthy to open up the scroll? The Lamb. He's standing in the presence. He goes and is he's surrounded by the four living creatures. Then I want you to notice verse 7. He came and took the scroll out of the right of it, hand of him who sat on the throne. So we have the Lamb, Jesus Christ, going to the person sitting on the throne who is the Father and he takes the scroll out. Now I don't want you to get caught up with that scroll, but I want you to listen to what happens. And when, verse 8, he had taken it, the four living creatures, notice what the four living creatures do. They always call to worship. And the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before who? The Lamb. In, in chapter 4, they fall down before God. In chapter 5, they fall down before the Lamb. Why do they fall down before the Lamb? Because it says that each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls of incense, full of incense, which are the prayers of who, dear friends? Us! Do you know that we are part of this whole scene? Do you know that what is happening in heaven between the Father and the Son has an impact on your life and you should be praying a prayer? So listen to what it says. And they said, a new song. Listen to the song. You are worthy. Who is worthy to be able to stand in the presence of God? You are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased land for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and a priest to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times, ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. What have we just seen? The inauguration, the acceptance of the Father of the sacrifice of His Son. Amen. Dear friends, the Father has been satisfied. Why are you still trying to satisfy Him? What you have to do to find acceptance with the Father is not to try and please Him. No. You can never please Him. Your works are like filthy rags. You can never enter into His presence. Never will He be able to say to you, worthy on you. Never ever. But look at this. 1 John chapter 5. Verse 11 started by saying, And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. Did you hear that? 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 says that God's personal testimony. And we're referring to the Father. The Father's personal testimony is He has given eternal life to us. 
And this life is in his son. And I want you to listen to this. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son, the son of God, does not have life. So dear friends, do you want life? Do you want an ending where you will live forever and ever with your father and heaven? then you need to accept the ending of Christ. You need to accept the ending of Christ. The ending of Christ was the grave. The ending of Christ was that his father had accepted him and lifted him up to his rightful position. Christ said, I received all of it. And he received it from his father. And Christ has the authority now to transfer it to him. Do you choose him? All you have to do to lift your feet, to change your destiny, is to accept the Son. Because he who has the Son has life.